this is a unique experience for me, a first time uh, experience because 10 days ago, I stood at the uh, pools of Bethesda and read this text. Uh, it was one of the last places we were able to see uh, while we were in Jerusalem. Uh, it is in the north uh, part of old Jerusalem, what, what um, would have been the boundaries of Jerusalem in the day um, north of the temple. And uh, fairly recently, an archeological dig discovered two pools um, surrounded by porticos just outside the sheepscape, just as it's described in the text. Um, and so I have the ability to visualize uh, this moment in ways that are really new and exciting to me. The text uh, speaks of Jesus being in Jerusalem, walking out of uh, the sheep's gate. It's now, that, that gate is now called the lion's gate. Um, and uh, in John's gospel alone, Jesus goes to Jerusalem three times. Uh, in the synoptics, we're familiar with Jesus going to Jerusalem just at the end of his ministry. But in John's gospel, he goes three times. Uh, and he could have been there for any one of three pilgrimage festivals at this point in the text, uh, either Passover or Pentecost or Sukkot, uh, also known as the Festival of Tabernacles or the Festival of Booths. All of those called for anyone who was able to come to Jerusalem to celebrate um, at the temple to do so on those pilgrimage festivals. And so we have this uh, encounter early in Jesus' ministry here in John's gospel, where he's at Jerusalem and he sees a man who has been ill for a very long time, like 38 years is not a short amount of time to have been ill. The two pools at Bethesda are, uh, one is lower than the other. So when the text talks about uh, the water being stirred, that is about times when the, the upper pool would overflow into the lower pool and the water would move. Uh, and there was thought to be healing properties uh, in that moment, in the water when it was stirred in the lower pool in that way. But there was a need if you wanted to take advantage of these healing properties to step into the pool with some immediacy, right? That would not go on forever. Uh, it was a short window of opportunity. And this man who was paralyzed was obviously there by himself and was perhaps a little bit trampled by others attempting to get to the pool every time it was stirred. What's interesting to me is he feels the need to tell all of this to Jesus, even though Jesus didn't ask him back. Let's attend to the question Jesus actually asks. Do, do, you, do you want to be well? The way the man answers that question with so much explanation makes me wonder if he heard something different. That if he had been asked a number of times a question more like, do you even want to be made well? Because you're not getting into the pool when you need to. He answers Jesus' question as if Jesus had asked him to explain why he didn't do what he needed to do. As if Jesus had asked him to account for the fact that he wasn't in the pool, in the window when he needed to be. It's, it's almost as if, despite the fact that Jesus only asks him, do you want to be made well? He was so accustomed to the way people queried him and challenged him right up to this point, that he didn't hear what Jesus asked. You know, human beings have that tendency to do that, right? To, to ask, why aren't you in the pool? Why, why aren't you uh, getting yourself situated there so that you're super close when it happens? Why are you letting other people get in front of you? Why didn't you ask for friends to come and help you, right? We do this. 
we see past the very circumstance that people are um, in and we see past their need, which ought to be so plain to us and begin to question the merits of their cause or the reasons for their need. We begin to ask whether they might not have done something to avoid a hurtful and harmful um, circumstance. We do this. We do it with people who uh, are struggling to find a place to live. Right now, the uh, city is hard place to find uh, an apartment, a, a safe uh, apartment. We, we have so many people who are struggling um, at risk for losing their housing or having lost their housing and um, working like mad to try and find a place. And rather than see their need and even just say to them, I'm sorry this is happening to you, we are so often likely to say, well, you know, you should have saved more and then you would be able to afford a different apartment. Or why don't you get a, a different job? I think we think we're being helpful when we do this. But what we're doing is we're seeing past someone's situation, making assumptions about what we would have done differently because we're more competent or more practical. And that's not helpful. And that puts them in a place where even when someone says to them, do you want to be made well? They feel the need to account for the reason they're in their circumstances. You know, sometimes we work double time to make something that's fairly simple, complicated. The people this man encounters after he is made well do that to. Not only have people very likely challenged him for not doing more to get himself out of his circumstances, once he is out of his circumstance, he carries his mat and runs across some of those who don't appreciate that he's carrying his mat on the Sabbath. Now, these people can't even see past that rule breaking to celebrate that he's been made well. They, they can't see past this need for everyone to conform to rules and are unable to, to, to see that this man is now made well. They see a rule, break, rule broken. They don't see a man healed. They cannot celebrate with him. They cannot rejoice with him. And then their ire turns to Jesus when they learn that he had the audacity, the audacity, I tell you, to heal a man on the Sabbath. We get stuck so often in our assumptions, in our privilege, that we have trouble seeing the person in front of us. And we have trouble feeling for their need. And we have trouble rejoicing in their blessings and joys. What can we do to lift the lens that we so often carry? It doesn't allow us to see people as they are, but allows us to get stuck in our assumptions and our judgments and in our need for conformity and for rule following. How can we begin to see and treat people as Jesus did? To see them authentically, to see them with compassion, to see them with concern rather than judgment and to respond to their need 
and to respond to their joy. This is a work we have to be about. This is not something that comes naturally. And it's not something that we can shrug off needing to do, you know, just because I'm not like that. I'm more practical. We need to work and make an effort to change the way we see and view and recognize those people who are in front of us. And when we do that, we get a gift of true and authentic relationship. Or when we see, we are so much more likely to be seen. And, and, and when we recognize one another's needs, our needs are so much more likely to be rec recognized. When we empathize, Others are so much more likely to empathize with us because our hearts are opened and the walls uh, and the boundaries that we build between one another, they fall away into the gift of recognition and community. We need to work to get ourselves unstuck from the places that we land in almost without thinking and and the ways we speak and orient ourselves from them and if we do this you know, remarkable things can happen being seen being known being acknowledged i would offer that that in itself is a form of healing And having someone to rejoice with you in the wonderful moments of your life and someone to cry with you in your need and grief and hurt, that is a form of healing that is yours to give. We close the season of Easter today. Now, for Christians, Every day is a day of resurrection and every Sunday is an Easter. So we're not putting Easter behind us, but we're closing this period uh, where we mark the celebration of Easter in a particular way. And as we do that, I want to refer you back to something I said on Easter Sunday. I quoted then Rowan Williams. It says, the believing community manifests the risen Christ. It does not simply talk about him or even celebrate him. It is the place where he is shown. And I want to invite you to remember that you have the opportunity to manifest Christ in the way you see and speak to and recognize and empathize with everyone you encounter. When someone is hurting and they meet you, it is your opportunity for them to meet Christ and to be seen as Christ sees them. When, when someone is struggling or has a insurmountable feeling problem, like trying to find an apartment in New York City, they don't need from you all of the things they should have done last year. They need to know you see and recognize their fear and their hurt. And in that way, Christ would be manifest. These gifts are yours to give. So let us to continue to celebrate Easter by offering our authentic selves to one another and to the world. And by seeing one another's authentic selves, just as Christ sees us and them. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.